Hola, ¿cómo están? Bienvenidos nuevamente a nuestra tercera edición de la Notting.com. Gracias por seguir ahí. Eh, ahora nos espera una tarde genial con unas speakers increíbles. La verdad que estamos súper felices de que podamos tenerlas. A continuación eh, vamos a presentar a nuestra cuarta charla de Chloe Mizagi. Chloe es VP en Estrategia en Point 3 Security, es Research, Security Research, y ella cree firmemente que la seguridad de la información también es un tema humanitario. Es fundadora de Woman Hackers y presidenta y cofundadora de Woman of Security. Nos va a estar presentando su charla sobre lo que son los derechos de los ethical hackers. Eh, welcome, Chloe. Thank you very much for our first talk in our track two. Uh, well, welcome. We are talk we are introducing yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And hola. My Spanish is terrible these days. I haven't practiced for a long time, but I got all of that. I understood it. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, today we're going to dive into hacker rights. There will be moments where this is going to be a little bit more US centric, but please note that chances are that might be applicable to you as well. So let's dive into this. So I just want to first say that this talk is completely dedicated to those who have ever had to disclose anything, um, who also are have been prosecuted for trying to do something good or just doing their job. Um, to all the people who are in the fight to bring rights for hackers, because there's a lot of us behind the scenes. All right. So if you don't know who I am, once again, my name is Chloe Masai. I'm the VP of Strategy over at Point3 Security. And when I'm not doing that, I'm also an ethical hacker advocate. I'm trying to push for rights for us. And by working with other organizations and persons to try to push out um, and change the public perception of hackers and what we do. I'm also the person and co-founder of WOSEC and the founder of We Are Hackers, formerly known as Woman Hackers, a podcaster for ITSP Magazine, The Uncommon Journey with Phil Wiley and Alyssa Miller, and also a hacker book club organizer. Basically, we read a book every month and it's usually written by someone in the hacking community. Um, and basically the author and those mentioned in the book do attend our sessions. Um, it's every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, so feel free to join us anytime. We are right now reading Tribe of Hackers Red Team. Um, that is my URL, and that is my Twitter and Instagram. If you want to know anything about me, it's most likely on that website, and also my Twitter and Instagram. Feel free to follow. My DMs are always open. Now let's get into the real stuff here. So this is going to be kind of scary at times, but we're going to dive in it together. So... You probably remember Equifax, the breach and whatnot, but did you know a hacker warned Equifax that it was vulnerable to the kind of attack that later compromised the personal data of more than 147 million Americans? And this was reported by Motherboard. Six months after the researcher first notified the company about the vulnerability, Equifax finally patched it, but only after the massive breach that made headlines had already taken place, according to their own timeline. Or perhaps you remember the Capital One breach, which is basically, according to the federal complaint, the breach took place in the stages across March and April 2019. But Capital One only became the problem on July 17th when a security researcher tipped the company to a public GitHub page that was displaying something that looks an awful lot like Capital One private data. But the real question is, but what if no one reported the breach? And unfortunately, this happens often because hackers don't report a breach due to the fear of prosecution. So 60% of researchers don't report vulnerabilities. And this was a statistic that was discovered by Amit Elazari, who knows that our laws basically prevent good hackers from doing what they do best, protecting you and me and everyone that we love. Um, she's been spearheading into the conversation of safe harbor. But also Hacker One's 2018 hacker report surveyed of 1698 members of the hacking community. And in that survey itself, I found that almost one in four hackers have not reported a vulnerability because of the company in question didn't have a VDP, which is a early disclosure program. Those try to notify the company through other channels such as email or social media also claimed they were 
frequently ignored or misunderstood. So why are hackers scared? Well, besides the prosecution looking for the contact info, reading the policies that have been burdened to report vulnerabilities, think about it. Sometimes it takes us hours, sometimes days, and then it comes weeks, and then we're just like, is it even worth it to find the right contact information to disclose anything? And perhaps they are hired to be a hacker and everything, but they can still get prosecuted too if not everything is in check. And I want to go over a couple of cases with you. So this one is via DJI, which, as you notice, that drone manufacturer. Well, they basically launched their own bug bounty program. In other words, they didn't go to HackerOne, Bugcrawler, Synac to do their bug bounty program. They basically did an in-house one. Um, so two researchers, uh, Sean and Kevin, basically found their bug bounty program and wanted to double check on their scope before reporting anything. So for their scope, their bug mining program covers all the security issues in firmware, application servers, including source code link, uh, security workaround, privacy issues. And Kevin, he wanted to just confirm once again and keep a paper trail of the scope to make sure that he was safe. It took them about two weeks to respond to him to finally confirm what is in scope. He then reported the vulnerability and he's provided about $30,000 for this finding. However, the agreement of receiving the funds offered no protection for himself. Because of that, he decided to walk away. The revelations resulted in the company challenging his findings and seemingly threatening him with a lawsuit tied to the Computer Fraud Abuse Act, also CFAA, claiming he went out of scope. Regardless of the fact, he made sure to confirm the scope. And in return, because of this, he posted the entire conversations um, publicly with DJI, and they finally dropped it because of it. It was a really bad PR thing for them. But overall, one thing to take away is keep a paper trail, one. The second thing is read it if you want to have some, to see the reality of what happens. In some of the email chains itself, you actually see internal conversations happening, and they claim that he was a risk, a liability for them, and this could be bad PR for them. So they decided to sue him because of it. It didn't turn out well for them, clearly. Another case is this with the two coal fire employees. You may have heard about it, but in September, the Iowa State asked the cybersecurity firm Coal Fire to conduct a penetration test to see if its staff could gain access to sensitive data or equipment. So the two coal fire employees found a door to the Dallas courthouse open. And when they closed the door to see if it would lock and then attempted to open it, the alarm actually went off. Following the protocol, the employees waited for the police to arrive and showed them their paperwork. And initially they were like, good to go. However, a sheriff showed up and was like, no, no, we need to arrest them. So they showed the evidence that they were hired and everything, they were still being arrested. They didn't have to spend a night in jail. The charges were later dropped um, of this year in January, um, but it's one of those other examples how you can even be doing your job and doing everything you're supposed to be doing, but still have to face possibly getting prosecuted. And I mean, overall community consensus is, is that language of what's in scope, out of scope, when disclosing or how to disclose can be really scary. And also the potential indictments, especially. It can keep everyone up at night. And that's even program managers. They're asking to get hacked, but they're not asking to get hacked badly. They also have struggles sometimes of how to conduct and handle situations when researchers report something. They don't keep them up to date on it. And as us, when we submit something, we kind of want to be updated about what's going on. But in the reality, all the organizations out there in government knows they probably need a disclosure program at this time because believe it or not, it's going to keep them safe too. And I know this is a scary subject, so here are a bunch of puppies, and I did put a cat in there for the cat lovers to see if you guys can find and spot the cat. Anyway, all right, let's continue now. <clears throat> so why are they scared of us? So why is the public scared of us, you guys? And the reality is that even though hackers are are not attackers, they're not malicious actors and whatnot, they're still being seen and treated as such. Um, because of this, it reduces the chance to report a vulnerability and can cause hackers to go on the dark side because they're seen as the same. So this is what happens when you type in 
uh, criminal hackers to the left. And this is what you see when you type in ethical hackers to the right. Once again, it's this hoodie darkness and sometimes with a ski mask, which is really annoying. But it's not just the imagery that we're also focusing on. It's also the language used in the media. And when I say media, it's referring to marketing and PR, um, you know, otherwise the press. Um, so the thing is, is that by using the term hacker to describe someone who's actually committing a crime, um, it's basically, it's putting us in a bad situation that we can't even use the term hacker because people think of us as bad and criminal people. And so that's really a bad thing because if you think about it, they should be using the term attacker or cyber criminal or just flat out criminal. But the thing is, is that the imagery and language does impact us. It impacts us so much because it continues to fear, um, basically have this idea that people should be afraid of us. And that's not what it's supposed to be about. We're, we're here to support them. We're supposed to protect them from attackers. We're there to protect them every day behind scenes, but they don't know that. And that's the problem we have is that we have these stereotypes and biases that exist through social construction beliefs. And if you're wondering, Chloe, what are socially constructed beliefs? Oh, don't worry, we're getting into it next. As some of you guys know, every time I give a presentation and anything, I always bring up the brain because it's really important to know is how human behavior works. So we're able to fix the situation, but also have a better understanding in the world that we live in. And how humans react is something important for us to know anyway. So we're going to dive into a couple of things to understand how fear works and how socially constructed beliefs impact us. So first things first, if you don't know a socially constructed belief, it's basically the ideas and beliefs and that you have picked up since growing up or even when you're an adult. So this could be images on the TV. This could be things that you read in the, in the news. This could be things that you see images of. Um, but basically, it sets you up to understanding more about the world you live in. And so one of the things you need to understand is that there is a part of your brain called the amygdala. It's a very small almond shaped tissue that's inside your temporal lobe, which is responsible for your emotions, also for your memories and whatnot. Thing is, is that the amygdala is completely subconscious, but it was created in your brain to have a survival mechanism. So it basically is sorting who's like me, who's not like me. And based on that in itself, it lets us know who we should feel threatened by. So it's usually if you hear the amygdala, you hear this fight versus flight mechanism. Um, and that's basically what it is. It's sorting who's like me, who's not like me, so I can be preventative and take the right actions to protect myself because if the person's not like me, they're a stranger danger. In other words, they're the enemy. And so one of the things to think about here in this part is that when people are seeing the images of, of hackers being in a basement with a hoodie on, or just basically hearing in the news that hackers are bad people, they're, they're causing breaches, they're taking your, your information, they're utilizing it to make money off of you, they're taking away your privacy and whatnot. The thing is, is that all that imagery and all that language, what it's actually doing, it's creating the socially constructed belief that those folks are criminals. So we are criminals. And you might have seen this before where you go to an event and you tell someone you're a hacker and they take a step back like, wait, what? Or they don't even say anything and their eyes get bigger or um, they basically just kind of freak out in that moment internally, but you could totally see it on their face. Um, and that's, that's because that they have been conditioned to feel threatened by us. And because of that, it has created fear from images and language. And so your amygdala, which is your emotional response, basically then sends a message to your prefrontal cortex to let it know that it's a threat. So for example, if you were taught at some point that people with pink hair are dangerous individuals, when you see someone with pink hair, you might hold your purse a little bit closer, you might cross the street, um, you might like go into another place because you just have believed all around you that people think are dangerous. 
So your amygdala always sends a message to the frontal part of your brain to let it know, warning, warning, this could be a criminal taken action. Now, the thing to note about the amygdala is completely subconscious. However, it becomes consciously aware in your brain that you need to take a step or an action when the amygdala sends a message to the prefrontal cortex of your brain. Now, your prefrontal cortex acts like a CEO. It's verifying the threats. It's basically trying to figure out, is this actually a threat or not? And this is based on logic. This is based on storytelling too. So say for example, because the person like saw pink hair and knows that pink hair people are dangerous or whatnot, they hold their bag closer or they get off the elevator sooner because they always assume that the person with pink hair is dangerous. Now, the thing is though, is that it can always be challenged. So this is the time when you can challenge any socially constructed belief you have at every time. So the thing is, is that, okay, so um, say you watched a YouTube video and in that YouTube video itself, it was someone with pink hair talking about how hard it is in their life because no matter where they go, people see them as criminals and they always see them like holding their purse a little bit closer or crossing the street or going to somewhere else and to avoid them because they see them as a threat and how much that impacts that person with pink hair. So say, for example, you saw that video of the person with pink hair explain how horrible it is to be them because everyone's always seeing them as someone who's going to do something bad and how much that impacted them. So the next time when you see someone walking with pink hair and your amygdala is sending a signal to the prefrontal cortex saying, warning, warning, person of danger, at that moment, you also are remembered that video that you saw on YouTube of the person with pink hair explained how hard it is to be that person because everyone sees them as a criminal because everyone clutches their bag a little bit closer. So say, for example, you usually would have clutched your bag a little bit closer, but now since you saw that video, you're kind of checking in and being like, you know what? Maybe this isn't a threat. I saw that video and I think I need to not do that. So the thing is to note is that the most important thing is that you can always challenge biases, stereotypes, and whatnot, or socially constructed beliefs. You just have to work at it. And that's the one takeaway I want to tell you guys is about is that even if society sees hackers as bad people, remember there's a difference between an attacker and a hacker, but a hacker is a good person, right? Who's not trying to do anything, going out of scope and exploiting, right? So the thing is to know is in that moment, people can challenge their beliefs of who we are. And by hearing our stories and us correcting the press and trying to change the norm of how people view us, it's actually possible. It is definitely possible to change people's fear. They just have to hear us and have to also be open to being okay with being wrong. One of those things, humans, we don't like to be wrong, right? Because it makes us feel inadequate to present. But the most important thing is that it's the one takeaway from this entire talk is that change is possible here. Getting rights for hackers is possible. Even with people that saw us or still see us as criminals, when they hear our stories and they everything starts shifting and the narrative starts shifting in the way that really represents who we are, that's when we're able to move forward and gain rights. So the reason why we have to do this and change the mindset of the public is because this mindset set by society, by people in the media, it's keeping us unsafe and preventing us what we do well in. And right now, because of how the public sees us and views us, um, the problem is, is that companies are still afraid of having a vulnerability disclosure program. I mean, even 94% of the Forbes Global 2000 still don't have a VDP, which is something you may come to regret because we need everyone to help them out and to report things when they see a vulnerability. And the reason is that companies are afraid of hackers. They don't want to create vulnerability disclosure policies. And because of lack of bilateral trust amongst hackers and organizations and government, it's one of the reasons why 60% still don't report a vulnerability. Hackers are scared of these outdated laws in CFA and DMCA, but 
also from interviewing attackers themselves, one of the reasons they decide to move away from ethical hacking is the pay and the constant worry of being prosecuted regardless that they were within scope and they didn't exploit. It's something that keeps them up at night. And because of that, that's the reason why they're like, well, if I'm going to already be seen as the enemy to everyone, I might as well be the enemy to everyone. And this is terrible because this could totally change if we change legislation. So we're going to dive into legislation. Remember, this is going to be U.S. centric right here. But I want to let you know that all around the world, there is anti-hacking laws, anti-circumvention laws, and also um, acceptable use policy laws. So one thing to note about anti-hacking laws and anti-circumvention laws, a lot of them all around the world are based on the U.S. laws. So the U.S., when they change their laws around, then other countries tend to follow. And so this is one thing that we should keep in mind. So even if this is U.S. centric right now at this moment, it also impacts you most likely in whatever country that you're in because it does set a motion to change when legislation changes. So let's first go into the CFA. So anti-hacking laws, basically it's a law that um, prohibits accessing a computer without authorization or an excess of authorization. And this is usually used when a researcher goes out of scope um, and is also an act used to prosecute hacking. Now in the US, we have the Computer Fraud Abuse Act, which is a really random fact. We'll dive into CFA in a bit, but um, if you ever seen the movie War Games, what happened was that Ronald Reagan, when he was president, he watched it and he freaked out about hackers and was like, we gotta do whatever we can to stop hackers from doing terrible things to our country. Once again, he freaked out from fear and whatnot. And that's how CFA was created because he watched this movie called War Games. Anyway, um, let's go into the next one, anti-circumvention laws. These are also known as copyright laws. Um, basically seeing the right to repair or reverse engineering is a breach to property. Now, when we talk about terms and conditions, acceptable use policy, I mean, how many of you guys have actually read your terms and conditions? Whenever you have an update, because there you probably did it. And that's okay, because a lot of us, you know, haven't done it. I mean, I tried doing one with Apple, but I got so bored. And not to mention, it's so long. So I decided to watch the movie instead. But in general, they can be so long, too much verbiage, and it can confuse anyone, especially if it's written in English, and you're an English learner. It's really hard. Even attorneys have to look at this because they're written by attorneys. And by the way, I'm not an attorney, just so I should let you know. But the thing is, we have to be aware of that. Um, but miscommunication can seriously happen because of these policies, how they're written, because they're not very straightforward. It's all about, you know, loopholes and everything. And clearly, I just want to reiterate, if you see the dates of these laws, one is 1984, the other one's 1998, it is so old and out of date. I mean, Y2K didn't even happen yet. So the thing is, is that remote... <laughs> Remember, a lot of these laws are out of date. Second thing is that there were a lot of them were created out of fear. So remember the whole thing about how the amygdala works? So basically, when Ronald Reagan watched war games, he freaked out. He didn't try to go out into the hacker to understand what is a hacker versus an attacker. And with those that this was going to basically hurt and damage, to have them represented at the table that's what happens is that if we don't have empathy then and taking the time to understand all perspectives all those are going to be affected by a law what happens is that you prosecute good people at the end of the day and you have a law that doesn't really help the communities at all so that's why it's really important to have representation at all levels so the big takeaway is that there are laws that prevent good hacking in the same way they prevent attackers. And we need good hacking more than ever, especially with COVID-19. So I want to dive into CFA because if you are watching this, you need to know about it. So the Computer Fraud Abuse Act, once again, which was passed in 1984 because Ronald Reagan watched war games and whatnot, it's basically so outdated and it offers prosecutors discretion to threaten huge 
sentence and jail sentences to relatively underserving violations of the computer policy. First, the CFA, as Wren punishes exceeding authorized access to a protected computer, a phrase vague enough to inspire some really broad interpretations. Another flaw in the CFA is the redundant provisions that enable a person to be punished multiple times for the same crime. And these charges can be stacked on top of one and another, resulting in a threat of a higher cumulative fines and jail time for the exact same violation. And we'll dive into that when we talk about Aaron. So the next thing to know is that this also allows prosecutors to bully defendants usually into accepting a deal in order to avoid facing a multitude of charges from one single solitary act, which is just mind blowing. It also plays a significant role in sentencing. The ambiguity of this provision meant to toughen sentencing for repeat offenders of the CFA may in fact make it possible for defendants to be sentenced based on what should be prior convictions too but we are nothing more than multiple convictions for the same crime. The other thing that you should know is that if you are in the U.S. and whatnot, I know a lot of us are afraid of federal prosecution and whatnot, but it's not too much of a fear. Um, since 2013, the DOJ or the Department of Justice has done whatever they can to try to prevent such cases when ethical hackers are staying within scope or they're doing their job, they're not exploiting, um, basically to protect them. The thing, the, or I guess the real sectors you need to be afraid of using the CFA against you is local, state, and companies. <laughs> because it, companies have been using this the most um, to attack us, to be honest. Now, the one thing about the CFA case is that you've heard all the bad things about it. But it has actually impacted a lot of us in the community in a way that we may never be able to take back. And for the case of Aaron Swartz, it's so important for you guys to know about him and what happened to him and to understand why we need rights more than ever before. So in 2011, Carmen Ortez, the U.S. Attorney's Office, charged Swartz with hacking into MIT computer network to download millions of scholarly articles from JSTOR. It was supposed to be an act of civil disobedience meant to protest the restricted access to research funded by taxpayers. Um, but for this, the U.S. Attorney brought charges that carried a maximum penalty of 35 years in prison and $1 million in fines. Now, I want to pause right there because they were trying to push 35 years for him getting into articles. When in reality, did you know a first degree murder is 25 years in prison? It's, it's mind-blowing. But anyway, he was looking at a maximum penalty of 35 years in prison, $1 million in fine, and they were able to charge this amount of years because the way that CFA is written, is written and the issues that have yet to be sorted since it's been made into a law. Now, overall, looking at Aaron's situation, he was dealing with a 17-month legal battle, which had no set trial date, and it didn't look like it was going to end anytime soon. Through source perspective, it must have been so difficult for him and overwhelming because unfortunately, the future of the legal battle cast into doubt was the reason why Swartz, he hung himself in his own apartment on January 11, 2013. Following his death, the federal prosecutors then went on to drop the charges, but his family does say that it was the government's prosecution that contributed to his decision to take his own life. This is why it's important to talk about these cases, because these cases show us how we need to push more than ever to make sure we don't have cases like this ever happen again. And the good news here is that Aaron's law was something that was created because of what he went through. The unfortunate of it is that there was a lot of lobbyists, big companies that didn't want to see this get passed because they want to use it to prosecute their own employees if they step out of line, but also if any hackers get into their system or anything like that, that they could always turn around. And it's a really scary thing because the CFAA is just, it's so out of date, it hurts people, and it's a constant fear in the back of our mind just being a hacker. The CFAA is that one law that just, it kind of lingers as a shadow and it just kind of gets at you little by little. 
And Aaron's Law was something that was trying to push to change that so we wouldn't have situations like Aaron Swartz went through. But Aaron's Law overall, it removed the phrase exceeds authorized access and replace it with access without authorization, which is defined to obtain information on a computer that the accessor lacks authorization to obtain by not only circumventing technological or physical measures designed to prevent unauthorized individuals from obtaining that information. Now, the DMCA, the one thing you should note about is that there hasn't been any cases of hacking to deal with being prosecuted by DMCA. It's usually just by CFA. But overall, um, this was created as a piracy, in a sense. So it would basically make it illegal to circumvent copy protections designed to prevent pirates from duplicating digital copyright and selling or freely distributing them. It also makes it illegal to manufacture or distribute tools or techniques for circumventing copy. But in reality, controversial law itself affects have been much broader by allowing game developers, music, film companies, and others to keep a, a tight control on how consumers use their copyrighted works, preventing them in some cases from making copies of their purchased products um, for their own use or from jailbreaking smartphones, even if they paid for it and it's theirs, and other devices to use them in a way that manufacturers disliked. Now, the thing is, is that with improvements to legislation, we can change where we stand today. But in order to do that, we need to dive into three categories in which we touched on already because they work together to bring about public change. And remember, when we have legislation that works for us, it'll be a great thing for everyone else because it'll keep the world a little bit more safe. But we have to first influence the public, right? That's the most important thing. So in order to have uh, rights for hackers, we need to get the public on board. And in order to do so, we need to dive into these three categories. So um, we need the press to push for the public to become aware. In other words, we need to change the language and imagery of a hacker and start using cyber criminals for those who commit unethical hacking. Overall, really separate the two groups, attacker from hacker. In order to help the press, organizations need to be on board with bilateral trust. With having vulnerability disclosure programs by showing their support hackers and whatnot, the public does change their perception of their view in general. And the thing is when organizations and public opinion are motivated and see a different light of who we are, this does motivate legislators to get on board and update our current legislation so it will protect us. Overall, we need organizations, media, and legislation to have supporting hacker rights for it to become a reality. Now, how do we get there? Well, overall, we need to push for awareness of ethical hackers, and these are the five needs to get there. Now, how we get there, I need you. So first things first, this is a petition. So this petition is for anyone out there who wants to support us. You don't have to be a hacker to sign this. If you are someone who is a relative one and you are just tired of what you're seeing and hearing from your loved ones, they can sign it too. But the thing is, pushing this petition out is the first step. It's bringing attention to the matter and a mission for us to work towards. And everything I talked about is in that itself. But it's broken down by organizations, legislation, uh, media, and the hacker community. So yes, please sign and share this. The more signatures, the better. Um, and my next step from this is actually, I've taken that petition and I've partnered up with Brian and Hacking is Not a Crime. And Hacking is Not a Crime is in the works of being developed, but it's coming soon, you guys. And what it is, is basically us pushing out a new narrative of hackers. So then we work with the press to change the way that they showcase us but also work with organizations that are already ha helping the hacking community. So it'll be a one, like your one place shop for everyone who's a hacker to go to if you need help or assistance, or if you wanna help the cause, um, you'll have that for you. Now, the second step is to fact check the press. So anytime the press puts an image of us in a dark hoodie or uses the term hacker instead of attacker when they should, um, let them know, call them out. Be very nice to them too, because they don't know better. So it's, it's best for us to let them know in the kindest way possible. But 
Um, if you're ever struggling to try to explain to someone what's the difference between a hacker and an attacker, give this example instead. Uh, think of a hacker as a locksmith and an attacker as a burglar. This is a way that a lot of people also actually understand um, when you compare the two. The third step is that working with organizations to partner and campaign with us. So if there's if you work at a company or you know of a company or an organization that is interested in pushing the rights for hackers, contact me. Let's work together here because it's going to take a bunch of organizations to come on board to push for rights and more people the merrier um, to get this out in the public. Also, to push for your organization to have disclosure programs. We need some sort of coordinated disclosure. It's so important for us to be able to communicate with an organization when we find something because we want to protect everyone right now. The fourth step is to contact your local representatives to update the current legislation. Have a sit down talk with them, but don't go at it alone. Always go with another person. And it's really important for you to also get some training before you do go to talk to your legislators or when you go talk to the press. So there's one way how do you do that. There are some organizations that have some training with that that's free for you. Um, we are going to put some videos together to teach you how to contact your legislator, how to work with your legislator, how to talk to the press. So those are coming soon. Um, if you are in the U.S., it's really important for you to also follow the Van Buren versus U.S. case because it's going to be the first time the CFA is visited in the Supreme Court, and it's going to happen this fall. Um, and last piece, if you don't know who the Van Buren and U.S. case is, um, let me know and DM me. I just want to make sure I have some time for Q&A at the end. But basically, it's a former Georgia uh, police officer who was wrongly convicted under the CFA. Um, basically, the Supreme Court is right now looking at the interpretation because what happened was that Van Buren was accused of taking money in exchange for looking up license plate in the law enforcement database. He was convicted of violating the CFAA because he allegedly used that database for improper purpose, even though it was a database that he was allowed to access for work purposes. Under this expansive interpretation of CFAA, it would be a federal crime anytime a person violates a website's term of uh, terms of service. That's really important to know. That's kind of scary. So if violating terms of service is a crime, private companies then get to decide who goes to prison and for what, putting us all at risk for everyday online behavior. Um, this was submitted to the Supreme Court, so it's going to be visited this fall, but it's so important for you to pay attention and hope that this doesn't get through because we don't want to keep getting worried about companies prosecuting us. And the last step I have to say is um, support these following organizations. I'm the Calvary. They've been working since 2013 with the Department of Justice, talking to politicians to try to change the mainframe of how people think of hackers. Also, Disclose.io, if you want to have a good idea what companies are practicing um, bilateral trust amongst a hacker and the organization and whatnot, Disclose.io is a great place to get started to see what companies are have a disclosure program in the first place. Um, CERT Coordination Center, so CERT CC, is also a great place to know of, and EFF and the CTI League. So reach out to them if you want to support them, volunteer for them if they need volunteering or if they need funds, help fundraise or donate. The thing is, just reach out to these ones and find out how you can get involved because they can always use more hands. So the main takeaways from all of this is that overall we need to push for ethical hacker rights and we have to do that by gaining better perception of who we really are, which is really important. And so the five needs how to get there, you have gone through it and you know it now, um, but I do need your advice and assistance, of course. So if you want to get involved at all, just DM me. It's really important that we start this. But most importantly, I just want to remind every single person that the change starts with you and me. And we must not give up, which is the most important thing. We must continue to fight for rights because Aaron Swartz's life matters. Also, the other thing is that other people have been in situations similar to Aaron. And it's so important that we do whatever we can to prevent such cases from occurring. So we have to have their backs. And by doing that, it's 
pushing the public to understand that we're not an enemy here. We're here to help them. And we do that every day behind scenes. So it's important to understand that the change really starts with you and me. And I just want to say thank you guys for existing. Thank you to Not PinCon for having me. It was such a pleasure to be here. And I am in Discord to answer any questions that you guys may have. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Claude. It's, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, to, to thank you very much for a talk. Uh, yes, we have uh, questions. One, um, Claude, does it matter where you are geographically well, located to sing the competition? The pardon, sorry, the petition? Uh, it doesn't matter because this is a global thing because we're all over the world and the laws that we have in place in the U.S. does impact other countries. So anyone can sign it anywhere around the world. Just don't be a bot. That's all I have to ask for. Thank you. Another question related, say, in the, in the Discord. We are uh, reading the, the question in Discord. So if you have someone else, uh, please, Chloe, um, uh, please, first, could you put the links that you exposed it in your presentation in the track two, in the channel track two? Of sure. the curl. Oh, thank you. Because they're amazing. Sorry, it's amazing. Uh, well, another question is, I admire the work of Aaron Squares and Alexandra Albakian. So, sorry if I can't read uh, very good this, uh, this name. What other people on organization do you think are doing important work to realize or to release, sorry, information to the public? Uh, can, you can you repeat that question? That was pretty yes, long. <laughs> no, problem, no problem. What other people, organizations, do you think are doing important work to release information to the public? Right. Um, I, right now, CTI League is doing a phenomenal job to help with COVID-19. I don't know if you guys know, but there's been a lot of um, attacks on hospitals and also for medical devices and also companies that are connected to vaccine creation. And so CTI League is really being there to try to prevent these breaches from occurring. Um, there are also some other organizations that are doing that as well um, in the UK and in Australia. All you have to do is just reach out to me and if you want to get involved or anything like that, do let me know. But there's there are a good number of organizations that behind scenes have been doing whatever they can to help, um, basically help us disclose things. Okay. Another question. Many of the people making these laws are not tech savvy. Are there projects that work on education, these law makers, so they don't get information for movies? Yeah, um, I would love that. Um, so what happens is, is that uh, people, they'll read fictional books or they'll watch TV or whatnot. And the reality is that, she's going to speak out on, on politicians. There are some politicians out there that don't meet with people that are represented. And that's a huge problem because you need representation. So any party that's going to be impacted by some sort of law or creation of the law, you need to meet with them. And there are politicians out there that don't do that. And because of that, we have these ongoing problems that are created that really do impact those that are um, underrepresented in the community. And so it's really important is to try to get at least the media and big companies to get on board with it um, because this changes the mindset of a politician on how they view us. And that's what we need to do is like, don't, don't push out of fear push out of having empathy. If you want to work with a politician, know what they're, what the things that they're passionate about, they're trying to fix and let them know how protecting hackers is somehow part of that conversation. So you want to make sure that everyone walks away from a win-win situation. Um, but that's the best way is to, to really showcase how we are different from others and why it's important to utilize the hacker community to help protect um, our country and also to help protect other people when it comes to companies and and having our personal identifiable information. Thank you. Many people are writing in Discord that your talk is 
Tremenda, tremenda. It's like amazing, very good presentation. Thank you. Uh, we had another question, but we need to go to uh, the, the, the yeah. next uh, presentation. But please, I mean, that's yeah. the score. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Um, all the questions that you have for Claude, please write in, in the channel too on Discord and close will we answer uh, them. Thank you, thank you very much. Gracias a todos y a todas. Eh, nos vemos en la próxima charla que están buenísimas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.